Everybody well this morning? All right? Aiden and I uh, got to bed as quick as we could to catch up, and we did all right. It wasn't so much the jet lag as uh, Scotland is not near this warm <laughs> any time, <clears throat> and certainly not even this time of year. So we were adjusting to temperature. But it's such, again, a joy to be with you and just to see your faces. And I hear the little bit I heard last night of what you're into, the different groups, the chamber groups you're performing in and preparing with. And I just really want to bless that and hope that some of these thoughts from Colossians will increase your sense of why you do what you do. One of the major statements in the book of Colossians we'll come to in a couple days is that wonderful th statement where Paul says that in everything Christ might be preeminent, first place in everything we do. Well, this week in our chapel times, we'll be looking at various key passages in this Pauline letter to the Colossians. Today, you could have your Bible open to chapter 1, <coughs> although we'll be looking at two passages in particular. And as I said last night, one of my goals is to actually introduce you to a bit of the storyline, the, the narrative that has formed the Chehi Summer School of Music. Uh, I thought it through last night, and when I counted up from the first time I came as a teenager, uh, 16, almost 17 years old, and meeting Jesus through that and on uh, many more years as a student and then a counselor and then a chaplain and then trombone instructor and all sorts of things. I was involved here for 21 years and I'm so glad to come back home. And I want to pass on to you a bit of the narrative, the, the stories that have shaped that through these two men I mentioned, the founder, Wilmus Chehi himself, uh, his wife, Gladys, was very instrumental in my life as well, but of course as a man he had a bit more time with me, a lot more time with me. And Dr. Samuel Shu, who came after I was here and sought me out because he got in trouble with some of the rules. And <laughs> we became good friends, Sam and I, through that. And I'm going to introduce you <coughs> throughout with little quotes, little uh, stories, experiences I had with them that so impacted me for God's purposes in my life and I hope in the world. I took all of that and uh, I have this habit of I keep these three by five cards and when I see or hear something I write it down because you never know and I found all these old stories of Wilmus Chehi, what he said to me and Sam Shu, his, his comments and times with him and so forth. So we'll do a few of that. And here's the first of those, actually. So here's Wilmus Chehi, uh, later in life, and Dr. Shu, Samuel Shu. How many of you have any knowledge of, of either of them, either through just what you've heard or actually met them? Did anybody actually meet Wilmus Chehi? Floyd is the only one of our vanguard. <laughs> and uh, how many would have known Dr. Shu through personal contact? And of course, we were so grieved when he was tragically killed in a car accident in Philadelphia, but God is still in control, and Sam was in such good relationship with the Lord, but we terribly miss him. Here's the first from Uncle Wilmus, and it relates to, as we get into this letter to the Colossians, <coughs> one of my first times at Chey after I had really become a follower of Jesus myself. Wilmus, as he greeted me arriving at music camp at Muncie back then, took me just for a tiny stroll, put his arm around me many times. His arm around me was this symbol. It was like the Holy Spirit, you know, coming alongside. And he put his arm around me and he said, he knew I was preparing for auditions into music school which I did later that summer and went to the New England Conservatory of Music and Trombone. He knew I was working hard. He put his arm around me. He said, give only your best to Jesus, Wes. He is worthy of that. Give only your best because Christ is worthy of that. 
and he just encouraged me to practice hard. This applies so well to our excursus through Colossians, as we will see shortly. And this morning, in the moments we have, I'm going to do something a little out of the ordinary and unique. I'm going to speak to the faculty who are here. Now, not all of them are here, but you'll pass it on, or they can listen later. <laughs> Janet, where is Janet? <laughs> she promised me she'd be here. Yeah, she's probably having a nap. That's all right. Yeah, no worries. I want to speak to the faculty who are here to educate you in all things musical and spiritual and invite you as bright young students to listen in. It's like being at a wedding when you listen in to the sermon for the bride and groom. It's really for them, but we're all invited to listen and actually you take away a lot because you're listening to somebody else's talk. <laughs> So I'm talking to Graham and Floyd and Ben and Bethany and Anastasia and others in the faculty and the staff. Let's throw you all in there together, the counselors as well. And you guys just listen and hopefully take away a bit. Along a rather strange Colossian theme that I would phrase something like this, the slavery of even musical educators. The slavery, slavery of educators, even those that do it within the field of music. And to begin, I want to give you a, just a quick personal story. Uh, later in my sojourn, I finished music studies and that, and have kept that up, and that's a great part of my life. But I went on to do theological studies and eventually a PhD in theology at the University of Notre Dame. And I had come out through college and seminary and done pretty well. So I was kind of cocky and thought it was all fine. And I was going off to Notre Dame for my first introductory course. And we were given an assignment to read 10 books in preparation for this and write short, what they called short, pressy papers, which are kind of summary ideas of that. Well, short was five pages per book, so that was 50 pages of writing. And I really thought, oh, that's a piece of cake. And about two weeks before the course, I started to do that. <laughs> Not good. And I whipped off these papers, read the books, wrote five pages on each, went to the course. They had to be turned in. And the first class, Dr. Joseph Bleckensop, professor of Old Testament theology, was heading up part of my PhD work. At the end of a whole day, took me aside and he said, Wesley, I need to talk with you. He took me aside and he said, if this is an example of your writing, you will not make it. You might as well stop now. And I was gutted. I was so stabbed in the heart like failure before I've even started. I went home that night. This is in, you know, where Notre Dame is in South Bend, Indiana. And I was staying with a cousin who lives there. And um, I sought the Lord, and that morning I had read Colossians 3, 23 and 24. Don't turn to it, we'll come back to that later. But it so convicted me where Paul writes, Whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of an inheritance. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. And I was confronted with, I had not done anywhere near working heartily, and certainly wasn't in my head, I'm doing this for the Lord Christ. I was just getting it by, and Dr. Bleckensop pierced me with, you won't make it. And I changed my attitude. In fact, the next day I went to him. Uh, he, he really is kind of a man of nominal faith, sort of, sort of not. Uh, excellent scholar, but you know how academics can be. Uh, and I confessed to him. I said, I'm so sorry. And as a Christian, I have to say I was, I sinned by not working for the Lord in this. And I will change. And I did an about face and really <laughs> worked hard for the next four years and kind of made it through. Colossians is particularly fitting, I think, particularly suited, that is, to the role of Christian educators, in that one of its central concerns, very likely, was to respond to a type of very smug academic idolatry 
that some scholars refer to rather humorously as the synchristic soup of religious philosophical ideas that was so rampant in Colossae in the New Testament era. Synchristic soup <laughs> of religious philosophical ideas running around. And the Apostle Paul's counteractive to that is to raise up Jesus Christ to the very heights of his grandeur in what is arguably some of the highest Christology in all of the New Testament. Last night we said Christology is simply the study of the person, the work, the impact of Jesus as we see him in the scriptures. I want to suggest, first of all, that this incredible letter to the Colossians, for you faculty and staff, you guys just listen in, <clears throat> has something very important to say to us about Christ and the enlightened mind. Not the mind of the enlightenment, mind you, that has lots of good and bad, but an enlightened mind. We find this emphasis in chapter 1 uh, of the letter to the Colossians. So have that open, chapter 1, and particularly verses 12 and 13. The apostle is concerned to remind us about giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. For he delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son. This is the only use of this term light in the entire Colossian letter, which in, in itself can often be a clue, a clue to important interpretive significance, sometimes prominence, of an idea is alluded to in biblical writing by its very sparseness, its singularity, and the fact that this only appears once draws our attention. <coughs> One of the ways that we can understand, <coughs> excuse me, Paul's choice of resorting to this light-darkness contrast is in the common New Testament coupling of the relationship between light and life. Without light, there cannot be life. Light as a symbolic expression of what is eternally real, as contrasting with skotos, darkness, speaking of error or simply unreality. And all of this relating to what makes for meaningful living. Light that allows us to live fully. Light in this sense enables life by pointing both to what is real and to what is not real as we perceive it in our minds and then into our life and action. This is how this term is used throughout the New Testament, light. It correlates to truth and untruth. It expunges the ridiculous notion, don't ever follow this line, that truth does not matter. That it's just up to you to kind of arbitrarily say, well, that's true for me, that's true for you, but no, truth in an objective sense, what is true and what is not true really, really matters in how it comes out and how you live and how we live communally, or that truth is only personally and privately determined, or that it does not impinge upon public life. In the New Testament, that is ridiculous ideas. I know they're popular, <laughs> but they are not New Testament Bible. Light is about truth, to expose darkness which is not truth. And I want to deliberately suggest, therefore, that this genuinely encourages us to explore our work as teachers, as educators, especially perhaps music educators, how we can be and ought to be an expression of and an exercise in light for life. 
Ben, when you teach this week, I want you to go at it with, I'm bringing light to these students for their meaningful living. Not just wrote notes. That's easy enough. Anybody can, well, not anybody, but <laughs> I can't do the violin. But you can just do the hard work. But how do we bring that truth, that expression into meaningful living? Light for light. Life. Our work is meant, teachers, counselors, to enhance life in the same way that light is necessity for a uh, light is a necessity for life through creative artistry and poetic expression and technical proficiency and social understanding emotional spiritual betterment etc this kind of teaching in other words significantly significantly contributes to a more christianly holistic living by rigorously advocating for what is eternally real, eternally meaningful, what is meaningful for eternity, as opposed to acquiescing to what merely makes for survival. Lots of teaching in the world today is purely survivalist, what you need to get by to make money so you can live. And Christian education doesn't think that way based on light that brings life out of the domain of darkness and into the kingdom of Christ and his light that sheds light on all aspects of our world. All. And in this, Paul unhesitatingly points to Christ himself as the apex of it all. The Colossian context bears this out. As just a little later, if you look a little later in chapter 1, the Apostle again puts this in an ardently Christological affirmation, suggesting that in proclaiming Christ, it's at verse 28 of chapter 1, he suggests that in proclaiming Christ, look at verse 28, our goal is nothing less than admonishing every human being and teaching every human being and he uses this phrase en passe sophia in all wisdom passe all wisdom so that we may present every human being every human being teleon and christo complete in christ without jesus Giving meaning to music making, it is not complete. Now that doesn't mean there aren't very good musicians out there who have no idea of Jesus or any concern about Jesus. But the epitome of the meaning that comes through music making comes because Christ completes it. Its goal is Christ. David Ford at Cambridge University, I've met him and sat in with uh, incredible lectures under him, describes this approach to biblical ideal of integrated life as, listen to this quote, faith in the optative mode. What mode of music are you going to play? I suggest the optative mode. That means it's hopeful. It's projecting a future that God blesses. Optative. He goes on, faith in the optative mode evoked by the divine call of God and the insatiable desire to know, to learn, to experience, to be adventurous in the quest for more understanding. He goes on, I'll quote him, it searches the heights and depths of our fragile existence, says David Ford, always learning and discerning, never past being surprised. It is a faith whose source, hope, and delight is in the God of blessing, who loves through wisdom, giving of wisdom, as this text says, in all wisdom, and passe sophia, all wisdom, is Christ-based. And so, dear Chehi, music educators, teach your students 
in the divine optative mode. Don't settle for Dorian or minor. Go for the optative mode that does not hesitate to affirm that Christ is the apex of it all. Don't hold back, teachers. Let your students know that as they excel in music, they are aiming at Jesus. He is the apex. Well, we naturally then come to a second suggestion that I'll conclude with this morning in terms of this Pauline, the Pauline, not Pauline, Pauline is your girlfriend or auntie, <laughs> Pauline letter to the Colossians, noting something very important it has to say with regard to Christ and the enslaved mind. Not only an enlightened mind, but incredibly an enslaved one. And faculty, we must admit the shock value attached to this radical idea, for it's presented to us in those verses that I referenced at the beginning as they portray my own story in academia in chapter 3, verses 23 and 24. So turn to that now, 23 and 24 of chapter 3 in which we read, Whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of your inheritance. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. Now, teachers, educators, counselors, as you influence students, what is obviously bothersome about this otherwise very helpful admonition is that it comes in the context of Paul's, what the fancy language is, this is his house to fallen pericope. That means it's household rules of Christian living. And in this section, it is dealing with none other than the relationship between masters and slaves. You can see that clearly if you back up to one verse before, verse 22. Slaves, in all things, obey those who are your masters on earth, that is in the flesh, not with external service as those who merely please men, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Here is what is shocking. Given the reference to slavery, what should be noteworthy to you as a teacher, you as a counselor, to you and me, is how unquestionably this includes us. Marcus Barth, son of the famous, well-known Swiss-German theologian Karl Barth. Marcus, his son, is still alive and working, teaching in Germany. Uh, offers what most consider to be the quite conclusive summary in a 103-page introduction to the social background of slavery in the time of Paul's writing. That's the title of his introduction social background of save slavery in the time of Paul's writing. And Bart demonstrates how there were, to be sure, very privileged domestic slaves who were highly paid in high levels of administration amongst the wealthy estates, but they were slaves nonetheless. And very low slaves who, by nature of the abusive type of their work, were practically exposed to slow and even painful death. But the vast majority of slaves were clearly the slave middle class who basically had steady and sure employment. Many were in such positions voluntarily. It was a good job. And it included skilled craftsmen, craftswomen, artisans of all sorts, those involved in various fine arts, and those proficient in medical arts, and all educators. All educators were middle class slaves to the wealthy. Welcome to the enslaved mind, teachers. And it is with that in mind that we read these Christologically situated words here 
Whatever you do, do your work heartily. As for the Lord, rather than for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of your inheritance. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. And as we finish, I want to suggest then that this raises very briefly two huge questions for those of us who might consider our vocation to be something related to educational goals. Two huge questions. Who do you serve? And how do you serve? In terms of the who, the text from Colossians compels us to consider all of this rightly in relation to Jesus Christ. Whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. Perhaps some of us, just some of us who've been in this teaching thing, part of the educative systems that become mechanical and competitive and driven and ugly and demanding. Maybe some of us teachers are here this summer and we've lost that sense of calling and approach to musical education that is truly divine optative truly vocational, but I want to bluntly, blatantly, blatantly as possible remind you of this biblical injunction of those of us who care about holistic teaching that who you serve, your awareness of who you really serve is hugely important. And now just some brief, brief concluding <coughs> comments on the question, how do you serve? These same verses from the Colossian text tell us, don't they? Very clearly. For one, we should not overlook the verb in the phrase, to curio Christu dulu ette. It is the Lord Christ whom you Serve, duluete. It is in the mode not only of divine optative, but the mode of sacrificial service. And many religious type folk have a high and noble ideal of servanthood until they actually have to assume the posture of a servant. It's not easy. It doesn't square easily with many especially musically oriented egos. All the fine art egos. All the academic egos. My life would be so much simpler if I didn't have to deal with academics who are just so ego driven and my own sin in those ways. Do you conceive of your teaching in the role of being a servant? Floyd, are you going to serve these students? Janet? Bethany? It's not glorious. It's hard. It's, it's their glory, not yours. Because you're in the mode of a servant. Secondly, the phrase, do your work heartily, back in verse 23. That is so packed with meaning. It is quite loaded in content. Do your work heartily. What the text translates as heartily is literally ek psukes. Psuke means soul. So the phrase is literally ek psuke, out of the soul, do your work. Do your work from the soul is what the apostle is driving out. This calls for what I suggest we could refer to. Let's caption something now together. A new word. I would call it soul-based capacities. In the Greek culture of the New Testament writers, these soul-based capacities that if we had time we could unpack here but we won't. 
Included in summary fashion here were the three areas of soul-based capacity. The capacity for imagination. Does that have anything to do with music making? The capacity for passion. Does that have anything to do with music making? The capacity overarching for love. Does that have anything to do with music making? One of the ringing words in my ears is Sam Shoes saying, it is about love, Wes, that expresses itself through music. Love. When he died, there was all these accolades, and many people called him a true, one of the rare polymaths, meaning he could do everything. You know, he was just brilliant. But everybody said what came through in Sam Shu was he just loved people. Too much so that <laughs> he agreed with everybody. Because <laughs> he just loved them. And that leads me to a logical conclusion that allows me to share one final quotation statement from Sam Shu. There's my dear brother. Bless you. I hope you're enjoying Jesus. <laughs> and we're all coming soon. This statement has lingered with me over many years and continued, in fact, to challenge me. I have it on a card all rumpled up back in my file. One night after a Chehi concert under the stars in Muncie, Pennsylvania, outdoor, dealing with weather and bugs and dropping apples and train whistles and lots of fun, but you know, <laughs> truly aesthetically incredible if it all worked. <laughs> one night after one of these, you know, a Saturday night concert under the stars, Sam Afterwards, we would all go under the chapel area. It was a, a snack bar area, and you could order, you know, Coca-Colas and whatever, ice cream. Sam said, I want to buy you a milkshake. And we went to the snack bar, and as we sat drinking milkshakes, you know, there's people lolling around everywhere. We were reliving the, the highs and the lows of the concert. <laughs> The highs and the lows. <laughs> and in spite of some of the lows, this is what Sam said to me. In the best musical moments, the soul is freed to sing. Soul capacities. In the best musical moments, the soul is freed to sing. Students, are you listening in to what I'm saying to your teachers, to your counselors? When I adjure your teachers to approach the art of music as a soul-based capacity, that doesn't mean you don't work hard on the scales and the arpeggios and the key changes and the, all the hard stuff. The embouchure, the quirky reeds for the oboes and the strings with the amazing difficulty of playing when everything's so humid. And <laughs> I, I can't believe how these guys could do that. It is so wet and humid. They're slipping all over and Ben Shute makes it sound like incredible. <laughs> But it's so much more than that. It is a soul-based capacity to teach these students to let their voices sing. Teach your students with such a pedagogy these weeks that you release their soul, that it is all made complete in him, according to Colossians. Give them the capacity to join the Christ hymn, which we will look at tomorrow. Chapter 1 of Colossians, verses 15 to 20, is undoubtedly in New Testament scholarship a hymn that was passed around to the churches to teach doctrine, theology, to teach the grandeur of Jesus. 
tomorrow we will move from thinking about him to the Christ him itself. Lord, thank you so much for these students and these teachers, these counselors, all that makes Chehi happen. Bless this day as we step into it now. Thank you for Wilmus Chehi. Wes, give, give it your best because Jesus is worthy. Sam Shu, the best musical moments, the soul is freed to sing. In the name of Jesus, amen.